Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Curtis Valentine, and I'm your moderator for today. Welcome to our webinar, um, Post-COVID Math Recovery. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Reinventing America Schools Project and the 74. The Reinventing America Schools Project is housed at the Progressive Policy Institute and promotes a model of schools we call 21st century school systems, or systems that provide parents more choice and give schools more autonomy in return for more accountability. Our research shows that in urban America, public schools systems that do this produce the most rapid improvement in student performance. The purpose of this webinar is to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on math and STEM proficiency for black and brown students in America. Let's get started. Before I have my panelists introduce themselves, we want to survey you, those who are logging in right now and welcome you all as you all are coming in and those of you who are watching live on Facebook. We have a survey to better inform our panelists on who's in the virtual audience. And so for everyone who is logged into our Zoom, we want you to answer this question and you can only choose one and it's the one you most identify with. And as I often say, I identify with actually one, two, three, four, five of these categories, at least at one point in time in my life. And so which one do you most identify with as you come to this conversation? Is it, is it being a parent, an educator, a funder, a journalist, an advocate, or a policymaker? And I will tell you, nearly every one of these categories is represented on our panel today. And so um, we're so excited about that. We're going to allow you to take that poll and then we're going to share that with our panelists as the data comes in. So without further ado, uh, I wanna ask each of my panelists to um, introduce themselves, uh, where they work and, and what they do. And so uh, let's start with our sister, Michelle Stye. Uh, introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Hi, good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, I am the Vice President of Teaching and Learning at the National Math and Science Initiative, or NIMSI. We're based in Dallas, Texas, and uh, very glad to be with everyone here to talk about math recovery. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to hear more about your initiative. Let's go to Madam Founder Legra Newman. Hello, everyone. It's an honor to be a part of this discussion. My name is Lakra Newman. I am the founder and head of school of Purpose Preparatory Academy here in Nashville, Tennessee. Thank you so much. We're excited to hear more about what's happening in your building um, and how you all are addressing this issue. Uh, let's go to the Joe Napolitano. There's only one. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. So I've been a reporter for, oh gosh, 20 years, They're working for the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, Newsday. I now write for the 74, and I'm so excited to be reunited with one of my old Times colleagues. So that's been really, really fun. Um, and like I said, I've had a big focus on education, means a lot to me. Uh, and it's you know, certainly transformed my own life. So it's been a big focus of my work. Thank you so much. Um, I wanna go to my home state, the Garden State, uh, one that's in great hands because we have our sister in the Chanel McLeod from Project Ready um, at the Ready. Tell them about yes. yourself, Chanel. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Chanel McLeod. I'm the founder and CEO of Project Ready. We are a social justice organization that is focused on uh, voter awareness, voter participation um, as a way to get us closer to more quality education. Uh, in the city of Newark and hopefully soon across the Garden State. Uh, I am really, really excited to be with all of you today and to talk about a very important topic, which is education by way of that math recovery. No, thank you so much for being here. And last but not least, uh, my good brother, Patrick Jones, someone who uh, really just uh, encouraged me um, to have this conversation. He and I had a conversation about this topic a week or so ago. Uh, and I said, as soon as I got out of the car, brother, can you please join our panel? I want the world to hear what you just told me. And so you're going to hear about that in a second. But without further ado, uh, Brother Patrick Jones, introduce yourself. 
Hey, I'm Patrick Jones, Senior Vice President of Leadership and Equity for the Mind Trust. We're a nonprofit in Indianapolis, Indiana, that focuses on supporting autonomous schools uh, and, and agreeing that they are the best things for our children. Um, also been a teacher, principal, been an assessment editor, um, been a manager of principals, and just grateful to be here talking about the work. Uh, also very modest. You also uh, write your own curriculum. Um, and so maybe you can talk about that as well. Uh, but before we get into our questions, we want to get to the survey results. We want to see who's in the audience. Uh, a third of our audience members are educators. Another third are advocates. These are folks who are on the ground fighting for education. Um, and we do have parents, funders, journalists, and policymakers as well. But as you all are answering your questions, um, panelists, remember, you have educators, folks who are at the, at the forefront of this work, but those who are advocates who are advocating to policymakers to make change. In addition to that, we do have those who are watching um, live on Facebook who cannot respond to the poll, but we know are also here. So let's, let's get started. Let's start by putting this discussion into context. Gaps in math proficiency by race existed long before the COVID pandemic illuminated dramatic inequities in our public education system. In this post-COVID world, those students who were treading water before are in jeopardy of drowning without the right interventions. So Joe, I wanna to come to you. Um, from your reporting uh, at the 74, what did the national data on math proficiency rates by race and income look like uh, prior to the COVID uh, pandemic? Well, I have written a story on this topic a few weeks back, maybe a couple of months back, and Mariana McMurdoch over at the 74 did an updated version of this uh, that was really great that ran, I think, just a couple of days ago. And she had written that according to a recent analysis of more than 3 million fall, 20, fall 2021 test scores, the percentage of students who are on grade level has not yet reached pre-pandemic levels in most grades. And the gra gaps are largest in the upper elementary and middle school grades, which, which kind of, which makes a lot of sense. Um, a closer look at the data that she reported on shows that roughly half of third graders in predominantly Black and Latino schools are two or more grade levels behind in math and reading, which is 11 to 17 percent more than pre-pandemic levels. Another stat that I thought was important was nearly 50 percent of third graders in low-income areas are two or more grade levels behind in reading and math, and that represents a, represents a 10 to 12 percent uh, level higher than pre-pandemic pre levels. And it, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense that students are struggling kind of in the older elementary years, middle school years, that's when they start to get into a bit of more complex learning and principles that are difficult for some students to master. So I think this definitely shows, you know, not only are we not at pre-pandemic levels, but we've got a very, very long road to get to, get to a better place. And you discussed this a little bit in your answer, but like how much did COVID uh, impact those rates? particularly on the trend um, prior to COVID? I mean, one thing that math teachers had told me from my reporting is that, you know, students do need to learn mathematical con con uh, concepts kind of in sequence. And if they don't learn something, it really can hold them back. And I think it was also difficult for many math teachers to realize or understand online where their children really were. In other words, sure, there should be some ability for them to kind of somewhat see their students' work, but I think that's really not the case in all instances because of kind of technological limitations. And don't forget too, this is something I forgot to mention that when we look at these testing data, whether it's PISA or, or some other measurement, there were a certain segment of kids, and I think it's fair to argue these were among perhaps the poorest kids who were not included in some of these assessments. They either were not a, were not unavailable to take them, whether it was in person or it was online, they just could not access that. So I would say in, in my reporting, it was kind of, people had said to me, this doesn't, this actually, these statistics may not include the children who would be performing at the lower levels. So I, I hate to say that, but it kind of seems to me like this, in reality, this picture could be worse on the ground because it doesn't include the most vulnerable children. No, thank you folks so much. for And we have folks who um, hopefully will illuminate some of that for us today as we're talking about what's happening in their communities um, and in their school buildings. Uh, Michelle, I want to come to you. Um, and this, we talked about this actually before we actually went live. And this is this idea of um, 
stories about underperformance of minority students in, in math are all too common. Um, but the performance, the math performance of black and brown students uh, is not unique to black and brown students. It's actually an American problem. If you look at it in an international context and uh, Joe mentioned the PISA exam. Michelle, tell us about the, your work at the National Math and Science Initiative and what your research says about where we are as a country, but also into subgroups as it relates to math education um, in our country, but also how we compare uh, with the world. Yeah, Curtis, I, the National Math and Science Initiative was founded over a decade ago to address the, the, the disparities, certainly, in uh, student performance in STEM. Uh, it was a public-private partnership uh, that got us off the ground, and it was really that drive to think about uh, STEM outcomes for, st for students across the country being not where we need them to be for um, upcoming workforce uh, needs. Uh, so our business has long been going into school systems and partnering with folks in order to stand up pathways to STEM success. So we're really thinking about that vertical alignment. Uh, what do uh, teachers and school leaders need in terms of coaching, professional development, holistic wraparound supports that include curriculum and supplies, uh, to, in order to make sure that all students, uh, no matter what their zip code is, have access to really high quality STEM teachers and STEM courses and STEM materials. Um, and so that's been the work and that's all of our work as, as we've uh, faced uh, what is really this unprecedented pandemic, uh, which has spotlighted uh, inequities, uh, especially in under-resourced locations. Um, Joe, you referred to PISA, you know, NIMSI uh, it certainly it grapples with the fact that um, as a country, our math performance tends to be pretty mediocre. Um, there, they, there are nuances, um, really well-resourced schools or well-resourced families can, can do extraordinarily well on, on exam, you know, assessments like PISA. Uh, so, so I want to acknowledge that nuance, but, but on the whole, um, the country has really struggled with seeing math in particular as relevant, um, helping uh, teachers and students uh, use math as a language for creativity and problem solving. Uh, so uh, I think this is a really great moment. I, I am so excited to hear from uh, folks on this panel about what are people doing that are that is really innovative and creative because what we've done thus far is not getting us the kind of outcomes that we want for students in math. And we're certainly not engaging them in ways for them to see themselves as STEM literate, STEM citizens, or even that STEM could be a real viable and option for them to thrive um, as, as workers. So um, just really excited to be here to learn what, you know, hap you know, what's happening in the field here, but then to talk a little bit about what we do as an organization to help schools stand up these, this kind of rich, robust STEM ecosystem work that, that I think is, is really some of the answer to, to the problem. Well, wh while you're there, can you talk a little bit about that um, right now, which is sort of what are you all doing in schools? How are you all supporting um, high need schools um, and educators who are serving high need students? Uh, great question. Um, our first pass is to listen and to, to get in the in, into schools and hear what people are doing now, what's working for them, um, what, what doesn't seem to be working from that data analysis approach. Um, our strategy is to really think about kind of a, a three-pronged approach. One is how do we eliminate barriers in schools uh, to get to stand up advanced STEM classes like calculus or physics? Um, there, there are a stunning amount of, of obstacles in kids' ways to get to, to calculus, for example, uh, when half the schools in the country don't even offer it as an option. Uh, so, so one of our first uh, and important roles is to go in and, and try to remove barriers to counseling, to school leadership, to budgeting, uh, to, in order to get um, a clear path for students uh, to get to, to those advanced classes. It also requires um, pretty robust uh, real-time professional development for educators. 
um, both school leaders and teachers, um, and that is job embedded. So what does it mean to give teachers um, time to plan together with really high quality, great lever resources? Um, and what does it mean to think differently about the way we teach math, uh, kind of moving away from worksheets to, uh, to much more relevant, um, engaging, uh, creative work uh, that students can, can apply to their own lives and see the relevance to, to their own situation. And we also uh, really work hard to make sure that schools have the resources that they need, whether that's curriculum, whether it's supplies, um, or, or just, uh, you know, what, what does a school need in order to, to make sure that that physics class or that math class uh, can happen? Uh, calculators and uh, you know, incubators and uh, beakers uh, can, can be obstacles to, to getting kids into, into that, that work. So um, we, we try to have a wraparound holistic approach to, to the issues um, and really meet the, the school and the school system where they are uh, so that you can create that vertical pipeline to, to advance STEM and post-secondary career and college. No, thank you so much. That's so helpful. And I'm, I'm sure folks are, are cu more curious about your organization, um, but also how to partner. Um, yes. I want to come to you, Patrick. You know, the, the data on math proficiency rates uh, as a country, but also by race, speaks volumes, uh, but it only tells half the story. The what matters, but so does the how. And some would say we've been teaching math you know, all wrong, or we've been going about it the wrong way. And this sort of stems from the conversation you and I had. What is about how we teach math to um, under, underperforming students, excuse me, that you change or go about differently? Yeah. So I think one thing we have to understand, like math is a historical concept. Math was discovered, created, however way you look at that over the course of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. And we expect kids to understand that whole body of knowledge within a 12 year span, right? And so with that being intentional, a lot of people will call math foundational. You have to have this foundation to move into the next foundation. And I believe that's problematic because when you really understand mathematics, you understand it's not just foundational, it's compounding foundational, meaning the skills that are taught that are, that are necessary to understand the next skill, it, it actually in some ways can only just help you fractionally with the next skill because the next skill is actually represented differently in the next stage. An example of that is students can understand how to add whole numbers, but those same students still struggle when it comes time to add polynomials. It's represented differently now. So the concept of adding while still holding true is still a challenging concept. Another example is a conjugation when you're dealing with fractions in, in algebra two or whatever class people teach that in. And when you're dealing with the conjugation, I had better understanding of fractions and how fractions are equivalent or how a fraction equals one through conjugation than I ever had in fourth, fifth and sixth grade. And so when we think about math in that way, then we can understand that when people hold on to this idea of foundational skills, we have to go back and teach these kids these foundational skills is actually quite dangerous in some ways. Because when you hold on to that idea, kids never gain access to the compounding foundation principle where this new idea will actually be represented in a different way. So I'm, I'm an advocate for teaching at the grade level the students are. What that means though is, and you talk about the how, we're gonna spend a lot more time on a particular problem than getting through a whole bunch of them because we're still teaching the foundational skills within the new representation of the skill. So if I'm teaching conjugation or if I'm teaching how to add polynomials, I'm also teaching what adding is because students might say, well, this is a negative number, it's not subtraction. Well, negative and subtraction are different ways to talk about the same same thing. It's all addition, we're just counting forwards or backwards. And we have to look at the sign to determine how we're doing this. And so when, when we don't have those conversations with students and we don't take the extra time as opposed to just getting through a lesson and not keeping students on grade level and subscribe to this idea that if you don't have this foundational principle, you cannot move on to the next, we don't truly understand that that foundation is actually represented in a different way. So you can spend a whole bunch of time teaching students their foundation, but what's gonna happen is when they get to the next level, they're still gonna struggle because it's a different representation. And so I'm an advocate of teaching students at the grade level they are at and spending more time and going deeper on that particular concept. The other thing I would say is, you know, math, mathematics 
is essentially discovered or created or invented for the purpose of problem solving. It's a tool. It's not a, a thing in and of itself. It serves a purpose. And when we look at it that way, it's actually a tool that can create students or help students become their best problem solving selves. And we have to then understand like, what is the importance of that? We don't actually need all of our students to be super proficient on the current knowledge that we need so that we can have better factory workers. We need a lot of those students to start creating new knowledge. And I actually got this concept from the art of problem solving through uh, Richard Russick and uh, Chris Smith's ideologies. They talk about creating intellectual vanguards is what we should be talking about. So when I heard Michelle talk about this idea of math as a creative endeavor, it actually is because I was talking to you, Curtis, about competition math and the best competition math students are students who can create their own knowledge, their own understanding for how to solve problems. And that's what we should be trying to get at. And so as we move into this space where students are struggling with exams and students are struggling with tests, we have to one, stay on task with the current grade level they're in and spend more time teaching where they are. And we have to two, embrace the idea of curiosity and creativity as they are problem solving. The only thing we should be held accountable to is can they explain mathematically, it work logically what they are doing. That is the most important thing in math. If you're gonna take a chance, it has to be logically true. That's the most important thing here. The idea that, and, I'm, and I'm, we talked about this before, that you don't have to go back to go forward. Again, blew my mind because there's so many educators, school systems, parents who are saying, our children lost a year and a half. Um, and so we need to push pause on everything. There was talk a year ago to literally leave bring the whole school district back. Like just everyone, this is sort of retain the whole district so that you know no one gets left behind. And so when I heard you say that, I was like, well, it seems to give a lifeline to folks who are saying, okay, there's a way for us to move forward. And you're, you, you said it so well, on the grade level I'm in, understanding that I lost a year and a half or not, not nearly as much as I would have gotten, but we can go forward from, from here. Like, where did you, where did that come? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Um, because I think for those who are listening in, it is something that can seem very, very. Yeah. Uh, I think the thing is, I was a teacher for 10 years, Curtis. And so I've always worked with, with populations that have been behind in math. And my background, I don't do this, but I find myself having to do this. So people like actually give credit to what I'm saying. But none of student, none of the, any class I've ever taught has been below the 90th percent passing rate in any test they've ever taken. And that's eighth graders taking a high school test, that's eighth graders taking that eighth grade test. That is uh, high college, I mean, high school students getting ready for the SAT, it doesn't matter. And so these same principles are principles that I've been using. And so when I think about where this idea comes from is if I need this student to be proficient at the end of the day, there's no way I can take the amount of time it takes to go back and teach them how to, how to solve fractions. There's just no way I can take that time. So I'm going to figure out where fractions are represented in Algebra 2 or in Algebra 1. I'm going to find out where they're represented, where we are, because these kids were, I had kids that were three grade levels behind. I have to figure out where they are now, and I have to figure out what is being taught in the current subject that I can exploit. You see what I'm saying? To get them to be proficient in Algebra 2 or Algebra 1 or geometry or whatever the case may be right? Because it all connects. So how can we do that more times and explain more times and, and come into the classroom as soon as you come in? I need to know the concept. Let's go. If this happens and that happens, what needs to happen to this? And consistently drill in on the skill that they need to know to be successful, not necessarily from a, a, a remedial perspective, but from a, you have to know how this works now. Because the, the dirty little secret is when we so-called did have kids on grade level, they couldn't explain it either. You can find MIT students who can't explain certain things. This country is hard up for mathematical experts. We got a problem, as, as Michelle already said. Steve, Steve Jobs, before he died, said the reason why we had to take, take our factories to China is not because we didn't want to build iPhones and computers here in the United States, because we couldn't find enough engineers and enough time it took to build them. Mm. 
And so we just don't have the time. <laughs> we don't have it. We got to spend the time where it needs to be now and drilling on those concepts. That's, that's powerful. I know. And we mentioned earlier international experience. Um, I had a chance to go to, um, to Finland and sit with some of the policymakers there because this is at a time when Finland was number one in the country. And they said one of the reasons why we were doing so well is because Nokia went to the government of Finland and said, if you don't produce 5,000 engineers every year, we're going to leave because we just can't sustain the, you know, what we need here. And then you know, uh, the government responded, it was more about economics. But when I was there, they anticipated Finland falling off and they did because they said to that very point, we can't keep math teachers because with the ability to move throughout Europe and, you know, and, and to, to be able to, to travel that the competition for math proficient folks, even in Finland was being, there was a high demand in other parts of Europe and so they couldn't keep them. And people saw a dramatic drop in math proficiency um, in Finland. I also say I was in a conversation with um, the person who runs our career and techn technical education program here in the district, I'm on the school board here. And something he said, and I'm gonna come to you Legra and Chanel real quickly. He said something that really blew my mind. He says, you know, we talk about career and college readiness, and it's always just like, you know, this, this sort of divergence, you know, the kids who go here don't have to learn this and vice versa. But he talked about construction math, the math you know in order to be, you know, proficient in carpentry and other things, and how we're, you know, but also having that, there's there's still a path to the, you know, path to college and be prepared for a four-year degree. But there's there's just ways, different ways of teaching math depending on your career but also the motivation to want to learn math because students are sort of overwhelmed by it. But when you find out, oh, this is, this is the math you'll learn to build a home. You're really interested in building homes, but you don't like math, but here's a connection. That's a powerful conversation. I want to, we're going to continue this. But before we do, we want to go back to the audience one more time for a survey. And this is, I think is going to be illuminating for our panel, particularly you, Allegra and Chanel, which is to, our, to all the folks who are listening in, do you know your local district or charter network math proficiency rates compared to other districts and networks. So the question is, really, are you informed? Do you know where your school, your school district sits as relates to math proficiency? Um, and I think that in many ways for school leaders and for advocates is incredibly important that uh, constituents know where we stand and can advocate on behalf of themselves. And so Laker, I wanna come to you and the, the idea of parental engagement on student achievement is clear. Like where you lead uh, an amazing charter school in Nashville, Tennessee, that really puts math at the forefront of the curriculum and, and, and parents are literally enrolling their, their children in your school for that purpose. How did your school do so well in math and STEM uh, prior to COVID? Thank you uh, for that question. And I, I wanna say actually, um, Patrick, I had a colleague reach out to me and say that she was excited about this panel, especially because of you and that you had led professional development for her school. So um, very inspired already by what you've said. And um, part of our strategy will be leveraging, um, that's part of our strategy, right? Leveraging experts in math to bring that expertise to Purpose Prep, to train our teachers and to continue to grow and to continue to learn. Um, because even though we've experienced success in math, we still have so much work to do. The pandemic hit us very hard. Um, you know, our trend is similar to the national and district trend. Like our data dropped very significantly in math. It was really hard, you know, while we were proud of, of the virtual work that our teachers did, of their dedication, of transferring so many things to the virtual space and trying to figure out how to manipulate numbers and what was in numbers over a computer. The reality is, you know, there were lots of gaps that developed. And so we're in a recovery phase now at Purpose Prep of really trying to, to what you said, Patrick, right? Like not lower the bar for what students need to know at their particular grade level. These are the concepts, skills, standards that need to be addressed. But the reality is students can't access that if we don't think about what is the additional conceptual understanding that they need to be able to apply to that problem solving. And there's a few things that we're doing right now to figure it out. We're doing some of the things that we did before the pandemic, but I also say that if we, you know, we're back in the building, we're moving our work forward, but if we do things exactly like we did 
pre-COVID, there's a lot of lost learning in that as well. Like that happened for us to learn that what we were doing before wasn't as successful as it needed to be. And what are we gonna do differently in this time to really make sure that our children reach the levels of success that they deserve. And I'll be the first to say that we're still figuring it out. And a lot of it is leveraging other organizations and expertise. Um, and I'll share some of the partnerships that we've leveraged um, later in the panel, but really being able to think thoughtfully around how we can build upon what we know and what we don't know to make improvements. But some of the things that we're doing currently is using the value of time. Um, our math block is 75 minutes, and then we've added additional interventions for students based on their levels. Um, I'm actually one of the interventionists uh, at Purpose Prep, and so literally have daily groups with students. You know, our recent um, work was with long division, and, and that was really, really interesting for us to gather data because in the algorithm of long division, so much takes place, right? There's, there's division, but there's multiplication. There's place value, and even knowing like, how the numbers fit within the equation to what, you know, what is brought down? Where does this number go? Well, you know, what is divisible by, I mean, there's so many different concepts and it was just powerful teaching students and saying, okay, you know what? Let's actually break down the concept of multiplication. What's happening here? Um, conceptually making sure that we revisit that. And these are things that we typically wouldn't be doing with our fourth graders, but we're realizing that there's lots of gaps that they, they've acquired over time and we've got to fill those gaps. And so we are literally going back to what multiplication, what does this compare to? This is repeated addition. So how do you apply this to this particular problem? And so really kind of stepping back to intervene very strategically based on what we're seeing um, that students are, the gaps that students are demonstrating and understanding that there's gonna be a lot more intervention taking place this year because of the, the year that we just had. So being creative in that way, um, leveraging all different, you know, individuals with this all hands on deck approach. Um, so students know, and it is exciting because they're they're going to class, they're moving forward with the lesson, you know, per our scope and sequence of making sure that we're moving through and exposing students to those grade level skills. But they also are excited to go into their intervention blocks and really make sure that they're getting the additional conceptual understanding that they need. Um, another thing uh, that we think about at Purpose Prep is constantly balancing this conceptual with this procedural. And what we're realizing is, and a gap that we experienced during the, the virtual space was practice is so necessary. And students need to not only practice, but practice perfect, right? So what that means is like, and, and I think there's a saying of, of, you know, practice makes perfect, but it's actually like perfect practice makes perfect, right? You've got to practice in a way that is the exemplar. And what we're able to do is intervene at those moments because of we have a technique called aggressive monitoring. So we circulate the classroom. We see what students are doing every step. We wanna see that step. Okay, that's great. You move on to the next step. Oh, there's a gap here. Fix that before you move on to the next step. And that type of immediate feedback allows students to say, oh, okay, this is what I need to focus on. And it allows teachers to collect data around specifically what those needs are. And so that's something that we're really maximizing on. Like students need to practice and they need to be provided feedback that enable them to practice in a way that supports their, their growing understanding of the particular skill. You started off saying um, that you had really prioritized time. And so, I mean, you, you were a charter school founder um, and the idea that charter schools have more autonomy in length of school day, in some cases, length of school year, um, talk a little bit about sort of what, how your charter status gives you the freedom to make a decision like a longer um, block, but other benefits and freedoms you have to respond to this area of need. Yeah. So being a charter absolutely allows us to have the flexibility and the autonomy to make choices that have an immediate impact. We were able to look at the data, we were able to analyze the data, and then we're able to make moves on the data without a convoluted process or approval process. You know, so, so often schools have to go through, especially district schools, they have to go through so many layers to get students what they need. So for example, I'm following up after this panel, I'm gonna connect with Patrick, we're gonna set up some professional, we're gonna move forward because I, I know and I have learned and continuing to learn about what are the resources that we need to bring into our organization. And so we're able to make immediate 
moves to uh, make progress, whether that's time, again, reallocating our schedule saying, okay, well, this is the amount of time that we're dedicating to math, but actually, you know, interestingly enough, and we're still processing this, our literacy data was significantly higher than, than math. And like, you know, in some, some ways, I'm always interested by that. That's actually been our trend, but I'm like, math well, is just so much, you know, more matter of fact, what, what's happening here. But given that, you know, literacy is a huge focus of ours and super, super important, but we've said we need to prioritize math differently. We need to do different things here. So what that's looked like is, again, adjustments in time, make, you know, immediate adjustments to our schedule, to time, to add additional um, interventions that way, additional personnel. We have additional math tutors that come in and provide additional support. They're trained through Purpose Prep, but they have a different schedule where they're focused primarily on math. Um, we've been able to make adjustments to our curriculum, um, whether that's virtual programming. Like again, we wanted to make sure that students were still you know, navigating technology with mathematical concepts that way. And so we've still leveraged mathematical technology to kind of make that balance of how we're utilizing what we learned from the virtual space and still applying it, um, being back in the building, but then also what additional programming or curriculum resources that we want to provide. Um, the teachers had a collaborative session, our upper academy teachers, third and fourth grade, and they were like, we want you know, additional manipulatives or ways for students to really be able to even better conceptualize some of what they're learning. And so literally, they were searching for resources and we were purchasing those resources, putting them into classrooms, getting them into incorporating into lessons and lesson plans. So what I love about the work that I do is it's so tangible. You know, we have this problem that we are focused on solving. Our students are not where they need to be with math. What are we gonna do about it? Let's action plan. Let's generate what those reasons are. Let's rely on this data and see what trends we're seeing. You know, teachers were able to really dig into, okay, these are the standards. Fractions is killing us, but actually this is an area where we're, we're doing okay. So let's maximize what additional resources we need here versus here. And what that's allowed us to do is action plan and then generate what those solutions are um, so I feel really positive about some of the changes that we're putting into place. And it is, it's an ongoing process. It's cyclical. So every cycle, every assessment, every, you know, so often we're coming together and doing that process and getting additional next steps based on where we need to go um, and per the plan that we've created. No, thank you. Thank you for outlining that. And, and for those who are listening in, who shouldn't don't attend a charter school, um, just know that this autonomy, this freedom that LEGRA has, uh, is also seen in traditional public schools, uh, traditional, but also you're seeing school districts move in the direction of giving school leaders more autonomy in the similar, in the spirit of charter schools. And so that's incredibly important. This is, that doesn't have to be unique to charter schools, but we're seeing the benefits of it. Uh, before we, we, we come to you, Chanel, I wanna see our survey results and what percentage of the folks who are listening in actually know the math proficiency rates and so about, you know, about two thirds do, which is great. Um, but at least a third of our audience uh, don't have an understanding of how well or how poorly their child school or network is doing um, in math efficiency. So we wanna make sure that we address that. And I think groups like uh, Project Ready and what Chanel is doing in Newark is incredibly important at this space and really informing parents. And so Chanel, you know, during COVID, Parents like like me, you, and others, uh, not only parents, grandparents, guardians, had to become math instructors. Right. <laughs> Oftentimes sort of patching together a curriculum. I told some people we signed our kids up for cooking classes. Right. We're, like, we're, gonna, we're gonna use culinary arts to teach math or reinforce that. Yeah. Tell us, tell us about your experience and the experience of other parents prior to COVID and during COVID as it relates to ensuring their children are getting. Um, the math instruction they need. Yeah, I, I just want to name and probably uh, Patrick and maybe Legra will appreciate this, but I was just doing like A B patterns, A B C patterns with my daughter the other night, and I was like, "All right, let me let me get ready and brush up." And that's just kindergarten stuff, so we haven't even gotten into the big stuff. Um, it's been a challenge. What I appreciate about what we what you've constructed here for us today, Curtis, is you're bringing together experts, you're bringing together journalists, and you're bringing together advocates so that we can look at the entire picture of what it looks like for us to be able to continue 
to work aggressively toward closing the educational gap, uh, specifically the math gap that I think we've all been working toward in our own way, even beyond 2020. Um, it's the all hands on deck approach that I think uh, Patrick had mentioned that I find important. At the head of this conversation is a talk on math, but also I say at the head of this conversation foundationally is a conversation on our parents and families that are experiencing poverty and how that experience has and continues to impact our ability to close the education, educational gap. Um, math competence, which leads to financial literacy, starts in the home. And in the absence of that being in the home, our students, our parents, and families have automatically and continue to automatically be starting from a disadvantage. Um, the question that I found bubbling or questions that I found bubbling from our parents and families, especially as uh, 2020, from my vantage point, brought a highlight to what, um, and I'm just gonna go here specifically, you know, our black and brown families may have been experiencing um, is uh, specifically, how do I show up for my child um, as now the teacher uh, engaging with a teacher who is providing me resource and resources and tools from a digital world. But then the next question becomes, how do I even make sure that I get that access when I either A, don't have access to the technology, B, don't understand how to work the technology, or C, maybe I have all of those things, but I don't even have the access to the high quality internet that is needed for me to be able to get that access. Um, and so through our organization, we focus on breaking through the barriers that prohibit people from getting towards success. And we've been doing a ton of work around um, what it looks like to make sure that parents and families get these resources and get these tools. Through our research, we're learning that our parents and families that have experienced this lack of ability to get toward resources, and by the way, are still experiencing it, whether 2020 has closed out or not, whether the pandemic is dying down or not, is that our parents and families who, who don't have access to this high quality broadband internet that ultimately leads to the access of resources overall are parents and families who are experiencing poverty. And I'm naming the digital divide as just one example of several um, for reasons why we may be seeing uh, a, a people across America black and brown people across America that are trying to combat this educational gap that is now deepened since we've left 2020. Did that answer your question, Curtis? No, <laughs> I, it, I know it, I went it, but you know, um, you know, uh, you and I are from New Jersey, so we're having like a, a mind meld. Um, but yeah, I and by the way, by the way, I don't want, I don't want what I'm saying to be misinterpreted by any stretch. I, I think Legra mentioned, um, making it tangible, like she loves the fact that she can make it tangible. This is not to take our conversation philosophical. This is to say that as we are thinking about solutions, as we are thinking about actions, we cannot, uh, we cannot not look at, at the way our parents and families show up um, as it pertains to their ability to have, fin have finances, manage finances, all these things link back to math how that trickles down into our students and how the lack of understanding there is the beginning of the disadvantage that could be experienced when getting into school, could be experienced. And so my, my follow-up is, what did COVID teach us as parents about what our students need to be successful in math? I think this is, for a lot of parents, it was sort of peeking behind the, the, the curtain seeing how our students interact with other students, with the instructor, uh, how, you know, the, the methods, the processes of, of going about instructing, and our children obviously are very unique. What are some of the parents saying to you about what they learned about what their individual child needs to be successful, particularly in math, but also in other subjects? Yeah, I, I mean, and I'm gonna name this because as a parent, I think it's safe for me to say it, and working with parents and families, I think it's even safer. I think the first thing is I need to show up. I need to show up. I need to be an active participant and I need to be an active learner alongside experts like our teachers, 
like our administrators, so that when my child does come to me and hopefully things don't happen the way they they have happened for us in 2020, where we now get the kids back. But if ever something like that does happen, how am I fully equipped to be able to work alongside the teacher to prepare my child for success? Um, digging in a little bit to forever learning, and I know I mentioned the digital divide a lot, but I think it's just a very clear concept where I think parents and families were like, wait a minute, I don't actually understand how to use this tool. I don't understand how to bring certain things up for my child to get this access. And I believe it translates over to math where you may not actually understand what it is that you are explaining to your child, how it is that you can get your child ultimately to the, the success that's required for them to be successful and competent in, in America and beyond. Um, and so I think the call to action when we think about parent participation and we think about how we're building a village within our schools, when we think about parent voice and how parents are joining in on the conversation, policies, procedures, et cetera, that ultimately lead to uh, the success of the village. These are all things that have been at play here. Mm -hmm. No, I, I appreciate that. And I just, I'll confess, you know, I discovered that my children really excel at project-based learning. And as parents, like really, you know, going into the recycle bin and grabbing things and trying to put them in, construct things, obviously culinary arts, applying math and sort of almost um, tricking them into math for my kids really worked. Um, what I wanna do is, is, is throw it open to the panel everyone and this this gets into i think where a lot of our minds are now which is sort of what's next where do we go from here we're coming out of a historic pandemic but we're also coming out of an historic investment in education and billions of dollars going into school districts like my own here in maryland but throughout the country and so this is open to anyone who wants to answer how should school leaders and districts be spending this money, that's this, this recovery money, this money is coming from the federal government into these districts. How should these school leaders and these districts be spending this money to address these proficiency gaps in mathematics? And this is, any, if anyone can jump in. Can I ask, can I just add something? There's a particular population that, of course I care about all kids, but I'm particularly interested in children who are English language learners. And I don't believe there should be any conversation about education ever that does not focus on English language learners. A little bit about me, I was born in Bogota, Colombia, abandoned at a bus stop, placed in an orphanage, almost died there, randomly adopted to the United States, Northwestern University graduate, Spencer education at Columbia University. Um, so I definitely believe in the ability and power of children who are coming to us who do not yet speak English. Um, I feel like they're often radically underestimated. And I feel too that where I've observed in my book, uh, The School I Deserve focuses on this and it talks about how schools are not making the effort needed to reach parents who do, who do not speak English. There's not enough translated material. There's not enough community building with people who maybe speak Arabic in the community who can communicate to our families coming from Africa. My book is about a bunch of kids from Somalia, Sudan. You know, we are not making that effort to bring families in, to bring all families in. And so I just feel like, you know, it had to be addressed that a, a significant number of our children in this country are English language learners currently, or they have been in that program and have come out of it. And we have to make sure they're always part of that conversation. You know, th thank you so much for bringing that up. Um, particularly, I mean, is what's your recommendation to those who have uh, the need to serve the community, but are giving this money getting this money from the federal government, how should they be spending that money to support particularly English language learner students, but also their math proficiency? Because in many cases we're seeing um, they some struggle as well. I mean, I think, you know, building those relationships with community leaders um, and, and getting that message out. And there's so many powerful community leaders. I've heard them called spark plugs before. They're kind of like the bridge between the school and the community. Um, bringing those folks in to on a voluntary or otherwise uh, trans basis for translation. And the other thing, too, in terms of English language learners is sometimes people think, you know, we have to get these kids to speak English first before we can concentrate on, su on course subjects that often really is not the case. The kind of like what Patrick was saying that we have to kind of teach the children at their level using photographs, hand gestures, translation tools like Google Translate, call in translation services, any way we can to reach that child. Th these children are really, I think kind of like the last consideration academically. We don't place them in the right settings. We don't place them in the correct grade. We often overlook the fact that many are gifted and talented and we don't test them with, with uh, language 
tools that remove language as a barrier to their success. That should be a, a pretty universal thing, and it's not. Uh, so we're, I believe we are missing out on the talents of a lot of kids. If, if I was judged in an orphanage on what I might be able to do in this lifetime and the condition I was in, would not be at Columbia University. So I think we have to, you know, really look at all of our children with, you know, as, as we have to assume they all have gifts and it's our job to extract that gift whether they speak English, they don't speak English, they're whatever color they may be, they're whatever poverty level in the family that they might be. Um, that's kind of how I feel about kids. They all have something great to offer and it's our job to find it and grow it in them. No, thank you for saying that. Um, Curtis, I, I wanna add, um, Project Ready conducted a poll specifically with parents and families in Newark. Um, we polled a couple hundred people and we asked the very question that you asked. I wanted to give just the top results that came up. Uh, parents and families wanted um, wanted to provide special funding for students with greater learning needs, provide teachers with better instructional materials slash digital resources, develop tools to help teachers with students uh, academically with a specific focus on mental health, and they wanted uh, to offer more college credit slash work-based learning apprenticeships. Those were the ones that bubbled to the top on how to spend the money. Mm -hmm. Legra, you were going to say something. I think Patrick yeah. as well. Okay, there's just two things that I want to say. The first thing is um, at Purpose Prep, we're constantly thinking about how do we center our students at the learning, um, because we know that that's when they see themselves and what they're learning and they're so excited about it. And so I just want to um, name that, you know, knowing the history of mathematics, knowing that it originates from Africa, um, knowing that, you know, the creation of zero and the um, oldest mathematical object was found in Africa, like those that level of information it empowers our children to understand that math is you like you are math and make that connection i think about you know my upbringing i was you know i was a good student but i was so disconnected from so many concepts and understandings because i just wasn't invested in it. and so much of that was i didn't see myself in it um, because of the environments that i was in and i think that the more that we can also understand how to make those connections for students to see themselves to know their history um, to know how they connect and the, the, the past genius that they're inheriting, I think will also really get them motivated to really understand, know the truths of history first and foremost, um, but then also how they connect within that. So, so I wanna say that. And the second thing I wanna say is one of the things about Purpose Prep, and this is really how we've been founded, like we leverage experts. Um, when we don't have the answers, we're not staying within our bubble and trying to figure it out amongst ourselves. We're reaching out and we're pulling in. Um, there's two organizations that we leverage this year. One is an organization in Nashville called Knowledge Bank. They provide financial literacy. Our parents wanted more STEM connections for our, our students. We wanted that as well. And so this is an organization that, you know, literally we shared our economic standards um, and our math standards, and they created curriculum that we're able to provide as enrichment opportunities for our students around financial literacy and connections that they're making across other content. That's been very powerful. We're also partnering with an organization called Pivot Technology. They, um, they launched to provide um, adults with more technological skills and training. We're like, hey, how can we leverage and provide coding information and expertise to our students? And so that's something that we're pioneering now. And so you know, I encourage schools that as you're navigating this, you know, we're all, we've all navigated this pandemic together. How much more can we learn when we come together and say, who's, who are the experts in the field? Who knows this information and how do we leverage and share those best practices so that we can continue to grow um, that way? Patrick, you I know you want to speak and I, I know Michelle, you as well. How would you be spending this money? Where should we be putting our resources in order to address this? I'm gonna I'm gonna add to Legra's comment about uh, teaching children the the history of mathematics. I think is is really helpful. I can go on and on about why it's helpful, but there's a book called The Crest of the Peacock, which is really helpful in understanding the non-European history of mathematics. But the thing I would talk about is there's a privatization of math achievement going on. A lot of people don't talk about it. They they call our movement. Uh, the privatization of schools. It's really the autonomous schools funded with public money. But they're really, in real life, is a privatization of proficiency and a privatization of advanced mathematics. And what it is, is if we have affluent kids who grew up in, say, Brentwood, Legra for you, um, who um, are struggling with math, their parents just send them to the Mathnasium or Kumon or whatever the case may be. 
many of the kids we serve don't don't have that opportunity. The schools play that role if they can, right? And so when we look at the privatization of math proficiency and advanced math, that is what is happening. So I think one of the things I would really think about doing is how to bring especially advanced mathematics into our schools. There's an opportunity to reimagine what that looks like. And when I say advanced, I don't mean giving eighth graders calculus. I mean, how do we go deeper on what is considered to be eighth grade math? Because even what we do in Common Core in some ways can be considered surface level because we can be challenging kids a lot more with the content knowledge they currently have. Some of the skills I used to do that, there's a math competition service called Noetic Learning. Uh, and I used to uh, have kids compete in that. Um, and all the skills are accessible to kids. Really the problem solving is, is the challenge uh, and really being flexible, having mental gymnastics abilities with your mathematics. The other one is math counts is really strong middle school program. And then the last thing I would say is the, uh, I've talked about this before, the art of problem solving.com. They have an elementary program called Beast Academy, and they have an older program called just the art of problem solving. And they have course structures. They're really expensive, but they have programs where they'll work with your school for free. You got to talk to them about how, all the stipulations and how that works. But I think the more kids we get exposed to that level of mathematics, the more of a service we'll be doing to our communities. Because when kids go to uh, uh, MIT or kids, kids go to uh, Vanderbilt or kids go to Ohio State, our kids are suffering, even with the great education we're trying to give them. Because one of the things they don't understand is that at MIT, a 65% on a math test is actually pretty good. But we're conditioning them to think that 95% are the best score possible. But nothing in life, nothing in life that we've ever done, we've got a 95% on. So the mathematics at some of these institutions is more realistic, there's more purposeful problem solving. And we have to get kids to understand that. And if you've ever done a math counts problem, you're going to know, even as an adult, you're about to struggle. <laughs> Michelle, uh, advice, how should we be spending this money? Where should we put our resources in order to address this issue of, of of post-COVID math recovery. A uh, big fan of all of the partnership talk that I'm, that I'm hearing here, especially when we think about connecting community, parents, industry, schools, to wrap our students um, around uh, with, with a lot of support. Um, for example, uh, NIMSI is partnering with the National Cares Mentoring Movement in Houston um, in a, a demonstration project to think about training teachers um, in problem solving creative based uh, content, uh, you know, leveraging the partnership to think about the SEL uh, needs of students and the, and the trauma informed instruction that teachers need, giving, giving a lot of professional development and direct to student services. So I would just encourage schools to be thinking out of the box and how do you leverage community partners in order to um, gain the expertise of, of folks in the community who wanna lean in and help kids and support kids. Um, so I think direct to student supports, um, especially for those uh, curricular or activities like math counts or, or like others that are really thinking about um, making math engaging, fun, relevant, focused uh, on problem solving and, and just a really relevant language for all students uh, to, to help them thrive. We have two minutes left um, and I wanna give each of you 30 seconds to just say, where do we go from here? And particularly from the seat in which you sit. And so Legra, where do we go from here for school leaders and school founders? Chanel, where do we go from here for parents? Patrick, where do we go from here for those who are working with working to open schools, but also to teach math? Uh, Joe, where does, where does journalism go, particularly as it relates to this work? Michelle, where do partners like your organization go from here? And I'll start with you, Michelle, and it was our final word. 30 seconds, what's your recommendation for those who are trying to be like them? Yeah, let, let's um, help teachers and school leaders uh, think creatively, uh, give them the resources and the training and support that they need in order to um, really rethink math. Uh, so uh, I, th I think so support the adults in the building. Joe, where do we go from here? I mean, in terms of journalism, I think it's always great to share best practices. It's great to look at districts that are doing things really, really well and find out how they did that and kind of reverse engineer it and repeat it wherever we possibly can. Thank you. Patrick, where do we go from here? School leaders, specifically founding school leaders and those serving black and brown kids need to be very clear about what proficiency and life beyond proficiency looks like so they can design programming where their kids thrive past the K-12 continuum. 
Legra, where do school leaders go from here? We need to really push ourselves to reimagine the way that students learn and really think beyond what we knew before the pandemic. Uh, what were the lessons that we needed to learn from this pandemic and how are we gonna make sure that we're setting our students up from, with success, even with structures that may feel unfamiliar or unique, really pushing ourselves beyond those limits to provide our students with what they deserve. And we're, it, we're, it's okay for us to figure it out and not know the answers, uh, but be open to the changes that need to take place for student success. Chanel, where do parents, advocates, foot soldiers go in this fight? Let's get Patrick on a listening tour. <laughs> Alongside, <laughs> or, or in all seriousness, people like Patrick. I think that parents and families need to be hearing directly from experts. And I think parents and families want to be heard also. What are their barriers? What prohibits them from being able to support their children appropriately as we address this math crisis? If we can get something like that going, then I think we can start opening up the real conversation about how we address the total village in its pursuit. Thank you so much to everyone who joined, those who are listening in through our Zoom or through Facebook, to all of my panelists, um, everyone who is really working to address this issue um, this has been an amazing opportunity for me to moderate, but also just to listen. I'm a parent of a 13 and 11 year old. And so I come to these conversations wanting to learn more and I learn so much. I hope you do too. Thank you so much for joining us again. We look forward to our next webinar. Uh, again, this was sponsored by the Reinventing America Schools Project and the 74. Uh, please continue to follow our work as we continue to ensure that every student in this country, regardless of income, racial background, orientation, or language has the opportunity to be successful. Thank you all, have a great day.